Hi there, I'm Francesca Gamble, living and working in London as the founder of two businesses and a life and wellbeing coach. I'm Francesca's Uncle Kevin, and yes, that's a real uncle, living and working in Oregon, USA as a priest, counsellor, theatre director and spiritual director. Welcome to Becoming More Human. An intergenerational, intercontinental and always, we hope, interesting look at how we can survive and even thrive at being human. Join us as we get stuck into life's most prominent questions and issues, drawing insights from our own personal and professional stories, as well as the creative minds and works of our favorite artists and writers. We invite you to share our conversation, figuring out what really matters on the journey to becoming more fully human. So grab a cup of tea or a glass of wine and let's begin. Welcome back, everybody, to Becoming More Human. Uncle Kevin, how, how are you doing over there in Oregon this evening? We are doing well, thank you, Fran. It's definitely autumn here. Everything is falling, and uh, the leaves and uh, the weather is going down and the temperature is going down. Well, this week's episode is a very special one. We have one hell of a guest. We have ex-Olympian, British-born heptathlete Louise Hazel as our special guest. How incredible was she? I have to say, I know we're doing a podcast and people can't see her, but as soon as she came onto our screen, it was like, wow. You could feel the energy. It was electric almost through the screen we were looking at. She's a beautiful soul, which just radiates when you talk to her. Absolutely. It was amazing to meet her. I was, having been living in America uh, for so long, I wasn't aware of her role in the uh, Olympics that were in London in 2012 or the Commonwealth Games before that. So uh, it was an utter delight to to meet her. And as you say, even on the screen, because Fran and I can see each other when we're talking. And yes, we can see Louise as well. And she literally, she just bursts through the screen. Amazing, amazing energy. She really does. At the start of this year, actually, Uncle Kevin, um, I went to Nike HQ in Amsterdam to to talk to their um, staff there about communications and well-being and a lot around this idea of um, comparing our learnings in life to becoming an athlete and how athletes train and they have coaches and support to get them to where they need to be. And as, as human beings, we plod through life without sometimes ever asking for help. And I think the comparisons for me have always been a really nice, easy one to kind of align yourself with, you know, asking for help building a right network around you and support. And I think during the podcast, it's something that comes through so eloquently and something I learned a lot from her is this idea of her as the athlete building a team around her to achieve her goals. And she was very focused, isn't she, about what she knew she needs to achieve, not only as an athlete, but now as a businesswoman. It's the the practice and the um, the the direction and also her her passion for something that she loves has just changed from being an athlete on the track. She's just changed that into now being a businesswoman. But the premise of of needing to be um, focused hasn't changed and asking for help, supporting others, and that comes across so well in the podcast. It, it does indeed. And I don't see her so much just as coming across as a businesswoman. What I see is she comes across as a teacher who happens to therefore have a business. That's the the mechanism through which she does her teaching, but uh, it's the service that that I hear in what she's doing. Um, the business just happens to be the vehicle that in which she does the service. Sorry, that's so true, Uncle Kevin. It does feel, in in that guise of being a teacher, something that's quite exciting when you listen to her is is almost what's next. You know, athlete, business, the next teaching. What what will come next for her in her next chapter of her life? We don't know, but. She is such an exciting person to speak to and has so much wisdom. There's so much wisdom for somebody so young still. She's got an awful lot of wisdom that comes through. She does indeed. Uh, and that just speaks to the commitment she's brought to her spiritual journey, the highs and the lows. And, and we hear a bit about both of those in the interview. We do. So without further ado... This is ex-Olympian and business owner Louise Hazel, so please sit back and enjoy. Lovely to have you on, Louise. How are you doing today? You must have had a busy morning already. 
Um, I have indeed. It's like one o'clock over here in Los Angeles. But yeah, it's been a great day. Um, you know, we've had a couple of tumultuous and, and tricky weeks to navigate with the uh, US presidential elections. But I feel like the general energy is that we're kind of coming out of that now and things are starting to look a little bit more hopeful. Well, we're thrilled to have you on this week's episode of Becoming More Human. I know you are super busy, a powerful woman juggling many different things, including your own business. So we are looking forward to deep diving into your personal story this evening. Now we ask all of our guests to pick a song, a film, maybe even a piece of poetry, which means something to you. What have you chosen this evening for us? Um, so the artist, I think, that has been very pivotal, I think, you know, in the past 10 years of my life is Maverick Sabre. Um, a young kid called Michael Stafford is the original name um, from Ireland. <laughs> Louise, um, I've just had to educate Uncle Kevin just before you came on. <laughs> are you here? Fran played a little bit to me and I like really like it. This is something I'm going to actually look up. Really nice. He's very, very soulful. Yeah. And in fact, uh, Michael and I met, we were um, at a rugby match, an England rugby match way back in the year. I think it was... I feel like it was maybe 2008. It was before I'd won Commonwealth gold. It was before the Olympic Games. And we found ourselves cheering on England. And we were, you know, um, enjoying the spirit of the game and having a few drinks. And I said to him, well, you know, I'll check out your music and see and let you know what, what I think of it. And we've just, you know, been friends ever since. But, you know, every, I'd say two years, he drops an album and I've been able to watch him you know, in London and see him grow as an artist and also as a person. And so when he makes his pretty much kind of annual trip out here to LA, we always make sure that we catch up. And um, I haven't listened to his latest album, but the one before last, I remember being in Los Angeles, I think it was around about 18 months ago. And I was sitting in a botanical gardens because I wanted to give myself the time to listen to it through, you know, in peace and quiet and I went through track by track and I just made notes as to how the album made me feel. And there were things, there were songs on there that, um, and his family is, is very musical as well. His father is, I think, where he gets probably most of his musical influence from. And you could hear there's actually a track on there that his father's singing on. And I believe the song's called Home. And it has this kind of element of Africa, almost South Africa, mixed with Ireland. And so there was this, this hodgepodge of like the jig with these amazing like um, uh, like ethnic roots. And I was just like the combination of those two things for me was just flipped me upside down. I was like, this is a brilliant album. Um, and he also always sings from the heart. You know, we talk in real life over the phone about the ups and downs of life and the heartbreaks and, you know, the motivations behind what's coming next. And so we've all, always had, um, you know, a friendship and a connection, but to also feel connected to the music has, has been, you know, a beautiful kind of journey, I think, for both of us. What a great choice. Fantastic. I love it. Now, going back to you, it's not every day we get to meet a Commonwealth Gold Medal winner. So what I want to know is, where did it all start? Were you the sort of kid who was always leaping over the furniture and running around at home? Yeah, a very, very active child. Um, it's hard at school, actually. I think, you know, primary school was my first real introduction to sports. And I can remember sports day um, and being fast. I remember, like, beating all of the boys and then that progressed into, you know, taking part in various different sports. Every night of the week, every school night, it would be either gymnastics or hockey, netball or rounders, even rugby one time. Um, it wasn't long before I decided against that. And then my father was actually um, a track and field athlete when he was younger, not to any professional level. Um, but he was the one that encouraged me to get involved with our local athletics club. And there I was able to kind of join the distance group. And then I realized the sprinters were doing less work. So I decided I'd join them. And, you know, I was naturally a power athlete, very quick, very explosive, lots of energy. And I think to kind of keep some of us kids in check, they decided to add in a few more events like hurdles and, you know, long jump. And that's where I really found my footing in the heptathlon. I was just a very good and solid all-rounder. Brilliant. I'm sure your teachers and your coaches were like, oh, we've got one we can work with here. Somebody who's got raw a talent that they could help pull together. Any any great highlights from that or any great low light from, from that period of your life? Yeah, well, I think, you know, the thing you said was true. I think my my 
uh, PE teachers were the first ones to instill that confidence in me. They could see something very special, natural coordination and athleticism. Um, and, you know, there were many ups and downs along the way. You know, I started my athletics career. Well, in fact, I started training at the age of, of 10. And at that point, I lived in Cambridgeshire. And so I quickly became kind of area champion in the sprint events and certain jumps events as well. Um, but, you know, the the beauty of the heptathlon is the fact that you are an all-rounder means that there are events that you're not necessarily as strong at. The shot put, the javelin, um, the 800 meters, uh, which I would only really compete in um, in the heptathlon. And so you were often getting beaten. You were often going up against people who were specialists in their event. And so what you learned was to have really thick skin and to not give up, even if you didn't finish on the podium. And I think that that's probably one of the reasons that I got so far, um, you know, in, in sport was because I developed this tenacity and this drive and this kind of unwavering spirit to kind of win and succeed and triumph over the adversities of not necessarily being naturally gifted in every event. During that time, Louise, did you have um, quite a lot of support from your family? Did the people around you to enable you to kind of do all of that training? Who was your sort of biggest supporter? By far, my biggest support was my father. You know, I can say this hand on heart that I would not have made it to Olympic level or even Commonwealth level without the support of my family. And on a daily basis, that basically looked like them showing up, taking me training, um, Originally, it was twice a week. That then soon escalated into five times a week. And because we lived in a very rural area in in a town called March in Cambridgeshire, you know, the nearest 400 metre track was 30 minutes away. And so it was a commitment. And so when I'm speaking to young athletes and I'm talking to their parents, it's um, I'm always expressing how important it is for them to be actively active participants in their lives and their sporting careers, no matter how far it takes them. Um, because when you're a 10 year old or 12 year old, um, you know, it, it's kind of just seems impossible sometimes to progress and elevate yourself. And when I was 14, I think, in fact, I might have been 12. At the age of 12, we were allowed to take our bicycles onto our, uh, the trains. And so I would take my bike with my um, teammate, would jump on the train, and then we would get the train to Peterborough and cycle to the track. However, they only allowed two bikes at a time on the carriage. And so there were two other twin boys um, from our town that would also do the same thing. And so we would see them because I lived at the train station, I lived on the corner, and we would see them bike past, and we would then bolt and race it down to the train tracks and see whether we could get on first. Sometimes we'd get all four of us on. Otherwise, the boys would have to wait until the next day. <laughs> Louise, what is your spiritual practice? Because you kind of describe your sort of spiritual practice, whether it's a daily or weekly exercise. Mm. So for me, um, you know, every morning I try to wake up with gratitude. And they say this, it sounds always very cliche. And um, uh, I always kind of wake up and say and give thanks for, you know, even just waking up in the morning. You know, there are so many of my friends that um, are no longer with us. And I often think of their families and how they don't get to share those moments. And so just being able to wake up and, you know, and, and be thankful for what I do have and the opportunities that I have every single day is one of the first things. Um, often I pray for my clients that I have that day. Um, so if they're having struggles or whether they be mental, physical or emotional battles, personal battles, I always say something very quiet in my mind for them. Um, And occasionally, not so much as as much as I did last year, you know, I'll I'll, uh, meditate and also engage in things like hypnotherapy, which has always been great fun. Um, So my therapist actually does hypnotherapy as well. Um, And then church. And, you know, that I haven't been able to go recently because of lockdown. And I'm not going to lie, I don't necessarily like tuning in online because everybody's singing sounds much better in person. <laughs> um, and honestly, you can pick out all of the, the dark tones when you're online. So that's been great. But I've kind of swapped out church really for hiking. And so for me, that reverence with the world and reverence with the outdoors and with nature um, is always there when I go out on long hikes or you know, do something active and outdoorsy like mountain biking where there's just this little bit of um, excitement as well. I could skid and, you know, ruin my face and the rest of my body, or I'm going to have a good ride today. 
there's kind of many little spiritual practices that I do depending on how I feel actually and one thing I've noticed obviously is is quite evident obviously being an athlete you're highly disciplined as a person I wonder how that's played out in the last kind of 12 months at least when you're trying to juggle a business you're going through this huge spiritual journey where discipline can um can play havoc with you during those times um how how have you found balancing your natural disposition with kind of coming into becoming more you well the interesting thing I think you know I think my friends would say I'm certainly a control freak and probably a little bit too disciplined you know I'm the type of person that nowadays I'm in bed by 10 o'clock I'm up and I'm at the gym by about 6 40 and you know I put in a good five hours and and then um, peel off for the day and I can pretty much tell you my routine day to day and I've found that since really affirming myself and putting down roots in California I've been able to build a foundation that I can really build from and that was one of the things that I knew was going to serve me and, and I've you know felt before when I was back in the UK it wasn't until I felt firmly rooted in Birmingham that I was able to build my athletics career um, and aside you know from being disciplined there are times when I know I need to surrender and so um, now I'll engage in like, you know, once a month, I'll have a slay away day. So me and Eric, my boyfriend, will head out of the gym and we'll go and put our ideas down on the golf course and just get out of that environment so that we can be free again. And then also, um, I recently got a tattoo. So when you talk discipline, I ended up getting my Olympic rings done last week. So this was me um, surrendering. So I'd been wanting to get them done since two, and also I got another little tattoo. So that was the discipline. That was the dis- that was the lack of discipline. So you've got the you've got the gold the gold rings essentially from the Olympics, the five rings. Yeah, the Olympic rings, and then this one here is the North Star. I don't know why I picked that one. I just liked it. The um, tattoo guy was very good at them and I was like yeah I'll have one of those please it's fairly discreet it's not too loud or too big it's very British you can take the person out of Britain but you can't take the Brit (laughs) out of the person when I hear you talk I'm I'm reminded um because I'm knowing what you're doing now I'm reminded of a great spiritual um truth that is grace builds on nature and that that whoever we are deep inside somehow call it the divine the universe whatever words work for people but but that that light inside us is the 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 kindling that that light needs in the world so i know from where you're at now and this wonderful successful space in between uh, reading some of your recent interviews uh, you have a, you seem to have a really good hold on the balance between head heart and spirit, mind, body, and spirit. So I would love to hear you talk about how you've come to that ability to wind these three together and what they and what they give each other. The interesting thing is, Kevin, I wouldn't say it's always been that way. I'd say in the first part of my career, you know, up until I, I retired from sport, mind and body was very much in tune. You know, there's no way you can make it to the Olympic Games without um, this mental dexterity, Um, the ability to adapt and, you know, the mental fortitude and also the physical fortitude that um, you come to rely on as an elite athlete. And so turning up mentally and showing up um, physically was always an easy thing for me to do. It's just in my nature. And so it felt like I was always expressing myself and always aligned with where it was I was supposed to go. You know, when I look at my, um, you know, friends growing up, they would often be hanging around at the bus shelter in the evenings, you know, just doing kid stuff. And I never had an interest in that. I was always drawn and like a magnet to sport because I knew that it was my destiny. And I was on an altogether different path and I never really strayed from that. You know, I might go out clubbing one night, get a little bit too drunk and I'd still have to get up and hurdle the next morning, which always made for a good training session. Um, But it wasn't until very recently, especially after I um, retired from athletics, Um, that I discovered the alignment of the heart and really in fact in the past two years I would say because it's been the first time that I've allowed the space 
for emotion and to connect with myself emotionally because as an athlete it's almost emotion is almost drilled out of you you simply have to turn up and get the job done no matter what is going on in your life no matter how you are feeling that day you never get to really check in with yourself in the morning and say you know what I feel like I'm having a bit of an off day you don't get the chance because every day is an on day every day is a measure against you know the best that you can be and um so there's definitely in my life and journey as a human being, this being this real path and journey to surrendering, especially over the past two years. And I'd say that I've started to live with my heart more open, being much more open to the possibilities of who I can become and stepping away from what I've already achieved to kind of develop all of my life skills. And did something happen at the point in your life when you decided that you needed to kind of connect with your heart more was there a point of which you had that step change yeah and I would you know describe it it was it was very much the end of one of my very close and personal relationships it was a you know this overwhelming sense that I required change and that I wasn't on the right path and I was aligning with people who you know, it's not necessarily didn't see the world the same as me, because I don't think we really need that. But I just felt like I was more, I felt like, you know, if I stayed um, and accepted my life and my relationship and everything being very easy and handed to me on a plate, that I would somehow just slip into oblivion. I was always known that I'd been a front runner. I've always known I had to step out of the shadows, you know, out of the role of being somebody's girlfriend or whatever it be, and into my own lane and into my kind of own light you know you mentioned earlier Kevin and so um, there were some really brave and bold decisions that had to come along with that you know at the time I was living in America don't have family here whatsoever Um, and so um, that breakup really taught me how to stand on my own feet and I've always been a very um, independent person but this was um, a real coming of age for me and um, you know, in that process, it was the first time I went to church and it was the first time that I found God and I started to believe in something other than track and field and javelin throwing. Um, and so that for me, again, just started this whole new spiritual journey. And I've always been in tune spiritually, but never humble enough to admit that there might be something out there that is more powerful than I am. And is music part of your spiritual practice, Louise? Absolutely. I can remember the song that I was listening to. It was um, Sunshine. Um, I think it was by Labyrinth. And this is back in 2010. This is a song that I listened to in the warm up prior to going out and winning the gold medal at the Commonwealth Games. Um, and so there are these moments, I think, in sport where music is just linked. In, you, it's inextricably linked. There's a rhythm and a pace and a vibration to it. And I can remember it being so hot in Delhi. Um, And, you know, there was these stories of, you know, is the stadium going to stay up and is the track finished in time? And so you didn't quite know what was going to be going on with regards to the organisation of the competition. And I remember the lyrics of the song were, you know, let the sun shine. And I was like, yeah, let that sun shine. I'm like, I'm ready for it. Let's go. It's today. And then I can remember my 200 metres in London 2012, standing on the top bend, ready to close out the first day of competition, which again had been a roller coaster. I had a terrible high jump, a decent hurdles, a good shot put. And the 200 was the event where, you know, I tend to pick up points. And I can remember Katy Perry singing, um, I think, was it Firework? I think it was Firework. And I remember singing it. And also being on the screen and singing it and hearing, you know, the 80,000 people in the in the audience singing it with me. And I'm like, yeah, I'm a firework. I'm about to show you what I'm about to do on this bend. Um, Amazing. So, yeah, like music has always been there. It will continue to be there in my life and also, you know, in the major sporting events that, that come. Louise, we, you know, we know that, you know, having done, um, having read some of your recent interviews as well and obviously following you on Instagram, Um, You've been a big advocate this year for bringing people together and also raising the vibrations of um, inclusivity and making sure that people are held responsible. Can you talk a little bit about your playbook? Yes. So um, the playbook came around um, as a result of an open letter that I penned to the fitness industry. And, um, 
you know, I say we can't talk about this without mentioning the people that lost their lives this year. Here in the US, you know, um, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, amongst a whole heap of other people are just facing these just extreme, extreme injustices, um, you know, due to the systemic violence and also racism that exists within um, policing and the system. And so, you know, everybody was, I think, moved to action this year. And so I felt that it was the right time to um, unveil the way that um, especially women of colour feel walking into an environment in the fitness industry, which is predominantly male and predominantly white. So the playbook was a result of our open letter. Our open letter led to 120 women us sitting down and discussing what the main issues were um, in terms of representation within the fitness industry, in terms of inequality in the fitness industry. And the playbook essentially became um, the new set of rules. So this was established by myself and a number of a number of um, conversations with people of color and basically just stating, you know what, these are the new rules of engagement and these are the new standards that we're going to live by and we're going to set. No longer will we go to work for no pay and the idea that, you know, um, exposure is enough or somehow good enough kind of cemented, I think, a really great standard for how to move forward without, and I think one of the beautiful things about it, and I'm very grateful that I've somehow been blessed with some sort of grace. You mentioned that word earlier, Kevin. To be able to put it in across in a way and take my time and write it from a place where my heart was open, rather than it be an attack, because I felt like we had enough of that already. I feel like it's now actually a time for unity and bringing people together and saying, no, this is how we work together. This is how we move forward together. And if you work in entertainment, if you work, um, if you're an agent, if you work in marketing, then these are some of the things that you might need to consider. And if there are certain things that you're not sure about, come and ask us. It's an open door policy. We all want things to be better. I, I, I love that because so much of moving forward is about education. Um, as folks know, who've listened to series one, I am an openly gay man. I came out before either of you were born, which is awful to say, the reality is we had to, what we realized back in the 60s was that people would say, oh, I don't know anyone that's gay. And so we had to educate people. It's like, can I? Yes, you do. And I'm so glad we are seeing this now. There's the choice to educate. And yes, there's still anger, certainly, as there was in the gay movement and there was in the women's movement in the 60s and 70s. But... But the vast majority of, of people, even with anger, are also wanting to educate. They wanted to educate and heal. Yes, beautiful. You know, I think there's been a lot of pain. Like you said, that, that inequality has existed um, towards, you know, most uh, minority groups. And now there's this kind of, um, you know, only this year as well, we were marching for gay pride. And... Um, it's just beautiful to see now that not only are people turning up, um, I remember in Los Angeles, in fact, there was a Black Lives Matter and Pride March, and it looked like the same crowd as the week before. <laughs> and and that, isn't that beautiful? There's a marvellous film called Pride, and it's it's back in the, uh, it's when the miners' strikes were going on in Britain. And, and if you want a really good feel-good movie, watch Pride, because it's the link between the, believe it or not, between the gay movement in London and the and the striking miners up in, in the north of England. So one can build these alliances uh, between any groups. I, I, I'm partly a math teacher in, in my, part of my stories is teaching mathematics. And I, I remember somebody once saying about minorities and minorities and minorities, and I said, stop. If you add together all the women of the world, and all the gays and lesbians, and all the people who are in some way differently able, you have a huge majority. <laughs> <laughs> so the people who are the minority, and we need to love them into this reality, are the straight mm. white men. And, you know, like anyone who feels threatened by diversity, one has to have compassion for the people who are threatened. And a lot of straight white men are very threatened by the fact that when the minorities work together, we are a majority by far, and and our love needs to extend, therefore, to the underdog 
who has had power but doesn't know how to use it. Absolutely. Well said, Uncle Kevin. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Tell us, I I believe you have have a gym, which is probably closed because of COVID at the moment, but tell us about the gym. Yeah, so um, 18 months ago, um, and we, I basically built a gym um, in Hollywood. And it was a really interesting thing. You know, obviously, I moved to Los Angeles um, for the purpose of television work and also it being the center of the world of fitness. I was like, you know what? I need to be in the midst of it. Um, it's a personal training studio. So the type of clients we have come in are often actors, actresses, writers, producers, directors. Um, and it's basically just been a hub and a hive for you know, some of the most creative and inspirational people I've ever met in my life. Um, And I basically teach them and with, you know, our other trainers, teach them how to unleash their inner athlete. Yeah, once they first walk through the door and you tell them, oh, I've seen you before, you're an athlete, they don't believe you. But after, you know, three, four weeks or months of work, then suddenly they start to see this natural athleticism emerge that they didn't necessarily believe was there. Fantastic. I guess I want to ask you is, do you feel now you're first and foremost a businesswoman and athlete second? I mean, I've always really had a a little bit of a head for business, even when I was competing in track and field. For London 2012, I actually lost my funding. My father passed in 2008, which left me completely, it literally pulled the rug from beneath my feet. So I was was actually in my final year of university. So doing my finals, I just had a few exams left to sit. Um, The 2008 would have been a long shot, but it could have been my my first ever Olympic Games. Um, and that and it my father passed earlier on in the year in the May. So right up until, you know, as weeks before we started and went into our um season. And so 2008 was very much a write-off. My dad was 50 years old, he suffered um a heart attack and then later passed away in hospital um after he contracted a superbug. And so, you know, it was literally within my world was just flipped upside down within months and I was kind of left there with the pieces figuring out how to put it all back together and because you know I underperformed in 2008 I lost my lottery funding so yeah and you know the interest the reality of it is the politics of sport does not stop no it doesn't stop to support you it just keeps going did you have any mental um and a mental support at that time because that's quite a a huge undertaking having experienced death so suddenly it can obviously takes you out physically um which the impact obviously has been noticeable but at that time who did you have anybody around you that sort of supported you and became an important part in your life to kind of build those pieces back together well I think I became the rock for my family I think I was that person who you know was you know strong and I think the people that were strong for me was everybody at the track, you know, my high jump coaches, my long jump coaches. And I remember, you know, returning to training just two weeks after and my coach is saying, you don't have to be here, you know, take some more time. And I'm like, no, you don't get it. I need to be here. Like I need to keep going. And, you know, my father had been, like I said, my number one um, since the get go. And I was like, no, we, we still have a mission to complete. And that journey is not over just because he's not here. His legacy continues through me and everything that he'd instilled in me. And so um, I ended up raising the funds that I needed and getting the sponsorship that I needed privately to take myself to the Olympic Games. And on just two years later, I won the Commonwealth Gold. And the beautiful thing was, you know, I had 12 sponsors in Birmingham at the time to be able to deliver them a gold medal from the Commonwealth Games as a way of saying thank you was huge even though we didn't get gold that is definitely you know I mean? a, that's another <laughs> well done thank you that's that's inspirational and I think I mean it's obviously testament to you and, and 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 your personality and and your tenacious attitude I wonder with with being able to sort of turn your personality so quickly into strength and turn that kind of sad time and and that traumatic time that can change your whole life and you've turned it into something positive you threw yourself into into your sport even more despite you know um, what you were getting back from sport wasn't necessarily positive what was there a time which you had to come to terms with the, the the passing of your father and and has that caught up with you or have you managed to kind of deal with that as you go yes 
it's definitely caught up with me. So I think, you know, the thing that I've learned as an adult is you cannot run from pain or trauma or the things that we suppress. And, you know, uh, 2019 was definitely that year, you know, that year when I felt like everything came crashing down, gave myself the time to finally feel everything. And it was like, oh, oh, wow, there's trauma here years ago that was unrelated to, you know, anything I ever thought. And, you know, it was then that I, I first started to engage in therapy and kind of unpack all of the um, load that I was carrying around and unaware that I was carrying around. And so um, I think that those things there, you know, it's inevitable. There's always unpacking to do as, and I think that's part of almost being an adult. And the interesting thing is understanding that, you know, in the, in the US, I don't know whether you'll agree with me, Kevin, um, they're much more open to, uh, you know, unpacking and therapy and stuff like that. Whereas, you know, the UK fans stiff up a lip, <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's why yeah. we started the podcast because, you know, I mean, I'm I'm a well-being and life coach now and I'm running, juggling two businesses. And as you know, Louise, like two very different worlds from the kind of media side of it to kind of life coaching side. And, you know, I can do my job without having had some type of personal experience because, you know, working for yourself, forging your own life, you have to deal with these things to be able to grow and get, and get better and improve yourself. And um, Uncle Kevin and I would always have these chats, probably once every few months, wouldn't we, in, uh, from America to London. And that's when we thought, we have to stop bringing this, this out to the world because the UK, it is still stiff upper lip. People don't resonate. Um, talking about counselling and coaching is, you know, they don't have, people don't have time for it. Um, it's not where I am. It's definitely not where Uncle Kevin is. So uh, people would ask me when I came to I came to America in '91, and uh, I was 38 at the time. And when I'd gone through, my father had died, a relationship had ended, I had a job that was lovely, but I knew it wasn't fulfilling. And I did something that an Englishman never does. I went to see a therapist. And wow. years later, I, I, I mentioned that to my family. And my mother said, why did you need to go and see a therapist? You could come and talk to me. And it was on the tip of my tongue to say, it was you we were talking about. Um, <laughs> but, but not true. Not true, mom. I love you dearly. Brilliant. But, but it's, that, it's that sense. Um, and after I did arrive here, I'd lived in London for 15 years. And people would say, why would you come to, to uh, the West Coast after living in London? And I'm like, well, in England... When you say you want to do something different, people say, oh, we've never done that before. Whereas in California, they say, oh, we've never done that before. Excellent. Absolutely. And it's that sense of, you know, for all of the problems of trying to run a democracy on such a huge, phenomenally impossible scale, which, you know, the American experiment is, is a hard one because it's so big and diverse. But the thing it has is there are lots of open fields. There are lots of possibility. There's plenty of prejudice. There's plenty of old boys clubs and all the rest of it. But within all of that, there is also this, this deep root of, yeah, but maybe if we did it this way, it might work. And for those of us who, and I, you know, I would be honored to be in, in your lane as it were, but you know, this idea that I need to find my truest, fullest self, because that's the best way of honoring both myself and my gift to the world. There's a poem uh, by Miriam Will Williamson that was written, uh, not, that was read at President Mandela's inauguration in South Africa. And one of the lines is, who does it serve to play small? Mm. Who is made better by me pretending I don't exist. Mm -hmm. And and so a, a large part of why we're doing this and everything I've heard you say, for me, the, the spiritual journey is to become fully human and learn through our different decades to integrate the different bits. We never get it all finished. Even in my 70th decade, I am still putting the bits together. And at no one time was I perfect at anything. But as you said, you know, to begin with, it was the mind and the legs and the throwing. 
and then you add in the heart and then you add in the spirit and and then the wisdom and then the grace just grows and the beautiful thing about love and grace is that it always flows out absolutely and, and so i honor entirely what you're doing because everyone who comes to your gym and everyone that watches your podcast and listen to everything you're helping them become more truly themselves and that is a gift to them and to everyone they know absolutely you know one of the words you said that really resonated them kevin was honor and um you know our purpose is is very much that you know when you exist in your purpose and live in your purpose you are honoring yourself yeah i love that thank you for sharing that it's wicked <laughs> you are very welcome i <laughs> sincerely hope we get a chance to meet one day i'm not gonna oh, no doubt. i'm not promising to get on to slay and, and do one of your workouts <laughs> because <laughs> My my doctor would not approve. I'll come up in person. <laughs> we'll, we'll go for a nice walk. Yeah, <laughs> good idea. What is your biggest life lesson to date? Uh, my biggest life lesson is that um, my strength is actually my vulnerability. You know, I never realised that. I didn't realise that there was any strength to be gained from being weak or vulnerable or crying. Um, until I kind of let it all out. And I was like, oh, this is real strength. Feels good. What three words describe becoming more human for you? Just let go. Mm. Fantastic. Do you have a guiding thought or mantra you now live by? Um, oh, so this one actually has probably always been with me and it's big girl pants. And so that's when you're faced <laughs> with anything that is remote scary or triggers anxiety it's like I just imagine putting on my big girl pants pulling them up you know all the way up to my mid waist and being like okay let's get to work <laughs> so time, a certain time with big girl pants oh I love that thank you so much Louise you've been absolutely incredible guests to have on so thank you for your time and your incredible words of wisdom thank you indeed What an inspiring interview that was with Louise Hazel. It's such an honour to have that time with her this evening, Uncle Kevin. It, it was. It was amazing. It almost makes me want to go to the gym. <laughs> <laughs> I nearly got there. Uh, who knows? By the end of the week, I might get there when I listen back to this. Um, yeah, very inspiring, but also so gentle and loving. I mean, to see that combination of sweetness and humility, I mean, and, and surrender, a word she used many, many times. It was, it was utterly delightful. I mean, that is, I mean, I suppose the word I would use is charisma. This is a person that draws you in, not to worship them, but to ask yourself, how can you be better? And for me, that's, that's the exact definition of what is a good spiritual journey of service. Um, the one thing I would love to pull out of it, though, she used the word, even when she was young, of tenacity. And in the spiritual traditions of the West, certainly, the equivalent word that would be used is fortitude. And that is about the ability, when you have a sense of your mission, your role, what the world is asking of you, whether that's your family, the bigger world, whatever, to keep going even when the bad stuff happens. And in every um, spiritual journey, if you think of the Buddha, if you think of Gandhi, if you think of Mandela and Jesus and anybody else you want to add to that list, they all hit blocks in their road when you could easily say, maybe I should just give up. Maybe this isn't worth it. Maybe I've bitten off more than I can chew. But when you really, really know inside yourself that this is what you are meant to do and you keep going, and as the Buddhists teach, letting go of the outcome, even when she did not win medals, even when she did not even win the odd race or two, and there were many of those she talked about, she kept going. And fortitude is one of the primary virtues of the spiritual life. We have to do the discernment first, like what am I really meant to be doing? And focus on, on the, the essence. 
and then look at how we can achieve that. As we said at the beginning of this interview, she's a businesswoman, but really she's a teacher. And the business is simply the vehicle for achieving that. We have to learn to separate the vocation, and I would really use that word, each of us has a vocation. And then we look at the vehicle for achieving that vocation. And fortitude, tenacity is a really, really central um, gift and, and, and virtue to develop in achieving those ends, along with, as she said, humility and learning to surrender. If we don't surrender, the ego takes over and it becomes me, me, me. And what was so clear is that Louise tries to live as me for others. And a world full of people who live as me for others makes a beautiful world. That's a really beautiful way to round up this week's episode. Thank you so much, Uncle Kevin, for those inspiring words. It's beautiful to be able to hear um, you put everything into context in such an eloquent way and and leave everybody with that kind of lasting thought, which we can go into our weekend and into our week ahead with purpose. So thank you so much. It's always an honor to, to do this podcast with yourself and our wonderful guests. And we have many more coming over the following week. So please, please stay tuned in and um, like and review and share it with any of your friends and family who you feel will benefit. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye-bye, Fran. Goodbye, everyone. We'll see you next week. Take care, Uncle Kevin. God bless. Bye-bye.